right. Okay. This is by the book, Chapter 8, The Sting of the Blade. Wren found that doing dishes and laundry at the Hero's Tale Inn was much faster and easier than doing them in Alpendorf. For one thing, the well was close to the inn. For another, there was something odd about the water. A full bucket weighed less than an empty one, and the water seemed to heat almost immediately when she placed it on the stove. It was the cleanest, nicest smelling water she'd ever used. Even before she added soap, it smelled faintly of ripe berries, and the dishes and towels she soaked it in seemed to come dry much faster than she expected. Still, the work was dull and repetitive, and it kept her cooped up inside. Her only entertainment was Shima, who hummed a strange, lilting melody to herself as she began to prepare the midday meal. The caddis tail and body moved in subtle, sinuous motions, as though she could barely resist the temptation to dance. Wren finished as quickly as she could without slopping water everywhere. She wanted to have plenty of time left over to explore town with Owl. Her nighttime excursion had been rather dull, aside from meeting with Bruno. There had to be more to see in Sigborg than the closed shops and mysterious thieves. Who was that guy anyway? By the time Wren finished cleaning up, Al still hadn't returned. She stared out the front window, bouncing a bit on the balls of her feet as she watched for him. If he was gone any longer, there wouldn't even be time for a decent tour. Well, she didn't need a chaperone, did she? She only promised that she wouldn't leave before her chores were done, and there wasn't a dirty dish or linen left in the whole inn. She wanted to find out who this Bruno guy was, and she wasn't going to find out anything if she stayed inside all day. When she left the inn, the first thing she looked for was the centaur girl Hawk had mentioned on his way to town. Just as he'd said, the young filly had set up her stand near the ruins of the bakery. She had blonde hair like Wren's, but hers was in one long, smooth braid flipped forward over her left shoulder. Hi. Wren said, approaching the girl and looking at her, delighted by her strangeness. I'm Fox. I'm new in Sigborg. Up close, Wren noticed that the girl's ears were very large and a little bit fuzzy. Other than that, she was pretty. Welcome to our town, the girl said cheerfully. I am pleased to meet another person. I hope you are not as rude as the last one. Is he your brother? I am Hilda... Where did you come from? Alpendorf, said Wren, with a shrug meaning nowhere interesting. Hilda smiled at her. That, that is such a funny name. Funnier than Ferdefern? Wren thought to herself. You probably met my brother Hawk, she said out loud. He can be rude sometimes, but he's really nice. You'll like him when you get to know him. Hilda just gave a delicate little snort. I would rather get to know you, she said. You seem much nicer. Wren gave Hilda a crooked grin. She wasn't used to being called nice. So how come this place is so deserted? It seems like a nice town. Well, other than that building over there, Wren pointed to the city wreckage. My brother says a kobold burned it down, but that can't be right, can it? It is true, said Hilda. There was a terrible explosion. My cart almost caught fire. Why do you th suppose a kobold would do that, she said Red, puzzled. I mean, I thought kobolds were nice. In Alpendorf, everybody left bread crusts out at night, hoping they would come to do their chores. Well, every one except for my Auntie Willie. She made us do all the chores. Hilda giggled and flipped her hair. The tailor's wife told me that her sister-in-law used to have a kobold that came to her house every night while she slept. That was years ago, before the folly got all cursed and all the kobolds went away. I do not know why this kobold stays, or what it is so angry about. I wish it would leave Sigborg. My brother is an adventurer, said Wren proudly. Maybe he'll get rid of it. 
Hilda gave a du dubious snort, <laughs> then smiled again. So, your name is Fox, yes? My papa hates foxes. He says they are wicked thieves. Are you a wicked thief? No, Wren said with a grin. But I have met thieves on the way here. Or maybe they were brigands. Hilda shrugged. Thieves, brigands, robbers, bandits, they're all the same. Did they rob you? No, they were just nasty and they smelled bad. You must not be a thief then, because you seem very nice, and you do not smell bad at all. I met another thief who seemed kind of nice, said Wren. Then she frowned. He did rob me, though. Oh, there are no nice thieves, said Sild Hilda sternly. Or at least that is what my father says. Papa also says I am too young to go courting. I am fourteen years old. Do you not think that is not too young, do you? Somehow Wren felt that her answer was very important to Hilda. I don't know, she said honestly, but when people tell you you're too young to do something, it usually just means that they don't want you to do it. That is very true, said Hilda. My papa doesn't want me to ever get married because he'll lose the farm. It is really mine, you know. He only owns it because my mother died and I'm considered too young. Centaur males never own property. Really? said Wren. My brothers didn't tell me that. He thinks he knows everything about centaurs. Wren made a face and grinned. I've never actually met a centaur before. I'll bet you can run like anything. Perhaps I can race you sometime, Hilda said with a smile. You could come by in the evening after my stand closes, she suggested with a little flutter of her lashes. Think of the fun we could have together. Yeah, maybe we could go exploring and try to find the guy I met last night. Do you know a guy named Bruno? I do not know anyone by that name, said Hilda with a frown. And I know everybody. Maybe Bruno wasn't his real name, Red said. He was about this tall, dark-haired, had a short beard and a scar on his jaw. He works at night. No one works at night, Hilda said, except for the nasty tavern people. She gave a little shudder. That sounded promising to Wren. What tavern people? Hilda looked around and then leaned forward conspiratorially. There is only one tavern in town that is still open. It is called the Aces and Eights. Papa would die if he knew that I knew about it. Do you think Bruno might work there? Hilda frowned. Perhaps she was speaking of Berthold, the bartender. He comes by here sometimes and he talks to me. She wrinkled her nose. He is ugly and smells of sour beer. Wren shook her head, head, head again. No, this guy wasn't like that at all. She thought of his dark chocolate eyes, his lopsided smile. Definitely not ugly. Hmm, said Hilda thoughtfully. And your Bruno had black hair, you say. Berthel shaves most of his off. Yuck, said Wren. So Bruno is good looking, said Hilda with a smile. I will have to watch for him. I will let you know if he comes by. There are not too many handsome men in Sigivor. Thanks, replied Wren. I'm going to go look around some more. Come back soon, said Hilda. It is nice talking to you. As I said, there are not many very cute boys in Sigborg. She giggled at that, and her pointed ears turned red. I'm cute, thought Wren. As a girl, I'm funny looking, but as a boy, I'm cute. Well, to a centaur, anyway. Grinning, Wren walked away. So far, Sigborg was much more interesting than Alpendorf. There had to be a way to convince Falcon to let them stay. The sun, peeking through a break in the cloud cover, shone down from its midday position directly over the castle battlements. Hawk pounded so hard on the barracks door he nearly broke his hand, but there was still no answer. Sir Shearmaster! He shouted at the door at last. I mean no disrespect, but 
but I know you're in there. I heard you sharpening your sword. Please come out. I need to talk to you. Hawk heard the sound of boots on stone, and after a minute, the door to the barracks opened approximately an inch. Hawk could see a single pale blue eye peering through the crack in the door. The reason I am not answering the door, you fool, came the shearmeister's disdainful voice, is that I have no intention of returning your paltry, paltry mond. You have grievously insulted me. I'm not trying to get back my coin, Hawk explained. I have nine more for you. I'd like a lesson. The door slammed shut. Ten more? No response. Hawk folded his arms and stood his ground. I'm not leaving, he said, so you'd best get comfortable in there. Hawk waited for a few minutes, and at last the door opened again, two inches this time. Show me your month, says the shearmaster. Hawk reached into his money pouch and displayed the coins on his palm. The shearmaster opened the door a bit further to reach for it, but Hawk pulled his hand back. Not until you at least come out here, he insisted. Then I'll happily pay for a lesson. The shearmaster slammed the door again. Hawk stared at the door in disbelief. Even Wren didn't act so childish. Hawk was just starting to consider crossing the courtyard and using the stable master as a battering ram when the shearmeister suddenly emerged from the, emerged with two wooden swords, both about the same length as Hawk's own. Remove the weapon you wear, he ordered curtly, and take one of these wasters. If it's all the same to you, Hawk said as he took the wooden dummy sword, I'd just as soon wear my weapon even if I don't use it. It won't interfere. The shearmeister's scowl deepened. Very well, he said. And then he held out his one sword calloused hand and Hawk deposited the coins into it. Hawk felt a wave of anxiety at watching so much money disappear in an instant. However, a rush of anticipation quickly replaced the anxiety as he watched the shearmeister begin to limber up weaving his waster through the air in an intricate patterns with both hands. Soon, Hawk told himself, he would radiate that same kind of confidence with his own weapon. He'd be the perfect picture of a hero, courageous, skilled, and deadly to his enemies. Let me see if you are worthy of my instruction, said the shearmeister, holding the hilt of his waster steady at his right shoulder. The wooden point was aimed skyward. Begin in von Tag position. Huh? The Shearmeister rolled his eyes. Hold your weapon like mine. Oh, Hawk imitated the Shearmeister's stance. Okay, he said. I'm ready. With a sweeping arc, the Shearmeister brought his waster toward Hawk, and Hawk reacted, moving quickly to block it. The Shearmeister's blow was so fierce that it vibrated through Hawk's arm all the way up through his shoulder into his very teeth. His fingers went numb at the sudden impact, and before Hawk knew it, his wooden sword had gone sailing through the air and landed on the cobblestones of the courtyard with a terrific clatter. Without another word, the Shearmeister turned and gathered up Hawk's waster and headed back into the barracks. Wait, said Hawk. That wasn't a lesson. I didn't learn anything. You learned that you are not worthy to hold a vaster, much less the fine blade you carry. You have an arm like a brick wall. I suggest a career as a woodcutter. Give me one more chance, said Hawk. Have you ten more, Mont? The Shearmeister said without looking back at him. Well, n no, but in life, the battle ends when you are defeated. So it is with my lesson. You failed to seize the initiative, and thus the battle was over before it began. You should least face your incompetence with grace, at the very least. 
how am I supposed to improve if all you do is knock my sword out of my hand? You assume, said the Shearmeister from the barracks doorway, that you have the ability to improve. But your mind is as rigid as your arm, and that boy is a fatal combination. Good day. He slammed the door shut and barred it. Hawk said a word that would have made Wren's eyes pop out of her head, and he kicked so hard at the cobblestones that the sole pulled loose from the toe of his boot. Ow! he cried out as his toes struck cold stone. Ow! He hopped around on his foot one for one moment, cursing creatively. Then he stopped, looked around. The windows of the castle keep looked empty, but all the same. Hawk imagined that he could feel the eyes of the Baron upon him. This was no way to behave in noble company. He'd have to pull himself together. Next time, he'd be better prepared. He'd show that Schirrmeister that he was a worthy student. He knew he had the talent, and soon the rest of the world would know that as well. Limping slightly, Hawk made his way back towards the castle gate. He was in the mood to kill something. Falcon made it back to the Hero's Tale Inn just after midday, slightly out of breath from his hurried trip down the northern road. It had taken longer to clean the stables this morning than he had anticipated. Halfway through the process, the black stallion had escaped from the paddock through a weak spot in the fence, and the stable master had refused to aid in its recapture. Falcon had been forced to wheedle an extra coin out of the stable master, walk back to town, buy some dried apples from Hilda the, the centaur, and then use them to lure the ill-tempered beast back into its stall. Only then would the stable master allow Falcon to get on with his work. Now, fully expecting to be greeted with a hug from Wren and a disapproving look from Owl, Falcon was surprised to find the main room of the inn empty except for a stranger. The stranger sat at the table nearest the fire, his head on his arms. His turban and loose-fitting clothes looked expensive, but also looked badly in need of some mending and a wash. I excuse me, sir, said Falcon, hesitantly in Silmarian, not certain whether this man was sleeping. The man raised his head instantly, and his blank, despairing expression caused Falcon to feel an ex instinctive rush of pity. From the way the flesh sagged under the foreigner's eyes, it would appear that he had lost a great deal of weight as well as a great deal of sleep. I was just wondering, Falcon said gently, if there was anyone else here at the inn right now. You are a perceptive one said the man with the fluid cadence of a born st storyteller. His Silmarian, like the Caddis, was musically accented. With but a glance, you have rightly deduced that I, Abdullah Du, am the person of no consequence. At that, the man let his head fall back to the table with a muffled thud. Falcon just stared at him for a moment, mildly dismayed. I'm sorry, sir, he said. I I didn't mean to insult you. It's just that I expected my brother and si my brothers to be waiting for me by now. Nothing could offend me in my current state of shame and despair, Abdullah replied mournfully, raising his head to look at Falcon again. But yes, Shamin and Shima have spoken to me of their fine guests. A blessing upon you all for supporting us in this time of need. Alas, that our need should be so great. He held his arms in the air for a moment, as though imploring the heavens, then sank his head down on the table once more. Falcon considered entering the kitchen to ask Shima where Wren had gone after finishing her chores, but thought better of it. He didn't want to disturb her at work, and it also occurred to him that he had never heard her speak. She was either mute or terribly shy. In either case, it would be unkind to question her. Falcon sat down at the table across from Abdullah and rested his chin on his hands to think. 
Abdullah sat in a similar pose, although his vacant expression suggested he wasn't doing a whole lot of thinking. You didn't happen to see them leave, did you? said Falcon. Abdullah shook his head. I see little but my misery and poverty. Oh, you who make my cat of friends wealthy, could you not spare a single mon so that I may fill my emptiness with the humblest meals? Falcon felt a tug of pity. He, too, knew what it meant to be hungry. He reached into his money pouch and fingered the coins there. Only five mond, and it would cost six for Hawk and Falcon to stay at the inn that night. Eight, if he couldn't convince Hawk to let Owl and Wren return to Alpendor. Still, Falcon was fairly certain that there was money left over from yesterday's bounties. And there was also a high possibility that Hawk would bring more home today. Surely one little coin wouldn't make any difference. Here, he said to Abdullah, withdrawing a single mon from his pouch and offering it to him. I know it isn't much, but I hope it will be some help. Abdullah took the coin and bowed his head until it touched the table again. Oh, bless you, kind sir, he said. May the heavens smile upon you and your children and your children's children. <coughs> um, really, said Falcon in embarrassed bewilderment, it's only a mond. What is of little value to you, said Abdullah, is of great value to a beggar. Oh, the misery of being nothing but a burden on my friends and acquaintances. I know you could scarcely believe it, but in Shapir, I was a great man and wealthy. I believe you, said Falcon. Your clothes are very fine and you carry yourself well. Abdullah's eyes filled with tears. You are too kind, young master. I promise you, if my treasure is ever returned to me, I will show my gratitude by transporting you in style wherever you want to go. Among my possessions was a magic carpet, which I alone know the means to command. What a wonderful way to travel, Falcon exclaimed, smiling at the thought. Ah, oh, but alas, continued Abdullah, it is gone. The brigands have taken everything from me, everything but the clothes I wear and my dear, loyal friends. Shamin and Shima, uh, Shamin and Shima have done all that they can to keep me from starvation, even at the risk of losing their inn. Ah, oh, may you never know such misery. Falcon felt a stab of guilt at the idea that the caddis might lose their inn. He knew that Hawk should be paying them much more, but it was a struggle just to meet the price the caddis had set. It seems a shame, Falcon observed, that such bad things should happen to such kind people. Once again, your perceptions are keen and unerring, said Abdullah. It is the greatest of undeserved misfortunes. Abdullah produced a tremendous silk handkerchief from an unseen pocket and blew his nose with a sound like a herald's horn. How did this all happen? Abdullah sighed. <gasps> his small dark eyes focusing somewhere far, far away. Shamin and Shima had been waiting me, for me to arrive here so I could take them back home with the profits from my caravan. But my caravan was attacked, and now we three are destitute, stranded in this cold and unforgiving land. Falcon didn't like the sound of this. A pair of brigands was bad enough, but enough to attack a caravan? And now Owl and Wren were wandering around somewhere. Falcon st stood rather abruptly, almost knocking over the chair. He bowed apologetically as an afterthought. Pardon me, he said to Abdullah, but I nearly must go find my younger brother and sister. With that, he dashed out of the inn, leaving the bewildered Abdullah behind him. 
Already the shadows were growing long, and Hawk hadn't managed to chase down a single offer. They seemed especially shy of him lately. It was as though rumors had spread of the dreaded Hawk, nemesis to pestigy scavengers everywhere. Hawk grinned at the thought. The woods grew denser as he ventured farther north from the road. He had tried to stay within sight of civilization before, but today he'd have to risk running into something a little nastier and more reclusive than a loafer. There was no way he was going to end his day on, a sour, on the sour note that the weapon master had struck. He had to return to the inn with some sort of triumph to boast a, about to Falcon, however small. The trees here grew so close together that there were lingering patches of snow where the sunlight never touched the forest floor. Hawk walked on the snow wherever he could. It slightly muffled the sound of his boots. Even so, anything other than an old deaf monster would know he was coming long before he saw it in the shadowy forest. Slowly, Hawk drew his sword and held it ready at his side. Then he stopped. He was certain he was being followed. Straining his ears, he heard no sound. But he could feel menace in the air as clearly as the snow had fallen on the back of his neck. He turned and looked behind him but saw nothing. Cautiously, he continued ahead, only to stop again when he had the feeling of being haunted, hunted became overwhelming. Once again he turned to look behind him. This time he spotted a small gray shadow through the foliage, clearly visible against the large drift of snow. As the dusky patch grew closer, Hawk could see it was a wolf, but it was unlike any wolf he'd ever seen. It was twice as large, with wet-looking fangs that curved grotesquely upward from its lower jaw. Its shoulders were high and bristled like a boar. Narrowing its pale eyes, it made a sound deep in its throat. Hawk tensed, feeling every hair on his body lift. Frantically, his mind scrambled back over the countless pictures of beasts and monsters in the hero manual, trying to remember what he was seeing. Then he recalled the appropriate illustration, and his stomach clenched. Dire wolf. The only words he could remember from the accompanying description were these. Never, never turn your back. Slowly, Hawk backed up a step without breaking eye contact. As the creature stalked nearer, it gave a keening growl and flattened its ears. Its lips pulled back from its teeth, which were startlingly white against the leaden gray of its muzzle. Then a smaller dire wolf, star smaller and dark brown, appeared from the thick foliage to join the first. Hawk's nerves shrieked with panic. Despite the urge to run, he held his ground, remembering the advice of the manual. Slowly, Hawk slipped off his leather backpack to use as a shield. He was used to holding the sword two-handed, but with two opponents, he would need to protect his offside. As he waited to see what the wolves would do, he suddenly seemed to hear a voice in his head. You failed to seize the initiative, and thus the battle was over before it began. Hawk stepped forward and sliced savagely at the weaker of the two wolves before it could attack. The smaller wolf deftly avoided the sword. The larger one leapt forward, and Hawk tried to block it with his pack. The gray wolf's jaws snapped shut on the pack, and its weight forced it from his arm. So much for that makeshield shield. Then another wolf, black as night, ran from the forest to flank him. Hawk felt a sudden rush of adrenaline. He was going to die. The world seemed to slow down all around it. He watched muscles bunch under black fur and then spring at the new wolf as the new wolf leaped for him. It would drag him to the ground and the gray shadow would shred his throat. 
Hawk began to stiffen in response to their charge, but he stopped again by that taunting inner voice. Your mind is as rigid as your arm. Hawk forced himself to relax and anticipate the wolf's movements. As it reached his left side, he swung his sword with a slight nimble feint he had seen the Shearmeister use. Confused by the unexpected attack, the animal dodged past him. The pack leader lunged toward him, jaws slavering. Hawk knew one sword would never hold off three dire wolves. Pure instinct took over. The brown wolf was moving for Hawk's legs, but the leader would reach him first. Hawk lashed out with his sword. The pack leader was so close that the hilt glanced off its head. Hawk turned to the side, and the black wolf narrowly missed his right shoulder. A white hot pain seared Hawk's calf as the brown wolf sank in its grotesque fangs from below. With a cry, Hawk managed to kick the smaller wolf away just as the recovering leader leapt to pull him down. If the wolves ever got him to the ground, he would never get back up. He braced and turned his sword sideways to block the attack. The wolf's momentum brought it crashing into Hawk and the blade slid right between its open jaws. Hawk leaned forward to drive the edge into the tender flesh of its mouth. Claws raked Hawk's chest as the animal pushed itself violently away. Before it could regain its balance, Hawk brought his sword around in a quick sideways swipe. Blood sprayed as the sword cut into the huge lead gray flank. The wolf's shrill, shrill yelp pierced through Hawk's terror, and he watched as the animal staggered away, then fell to the earth. One down, Hawk turned, heart hammering, to face down the others. Despite his pain, he watched with disappointment as the two remaining direwolves turned and fled. Giving up, cowards? Hawk called after them, waving his scarlet sword. His voice sounded strange even to him, and was greeted only with silence. Hawk stood a moment, catching his breath. He braced himself for the wolf's return. But as his heart gradually returned to its normal rate, he realized they were gone for good. He exhaled with relief and approached the body of the deaf, dead wolf, raising his sword to be wet, headed. With a snarl, the animal suddenly lunged to attack him. Dark blood poured from its mouth as it struggled to its feet. Hawk cried out in horror. The wolf's mouth dangled unnaturally open where the hawk's blade had severed the tendons of the jaw. It half crawled to him, leaving a trail of scarlet vis viscera on the white snow. Numb with dread, Hawk backed away from this oncoming nightmare. His sword was useless. Even if he decapitated the a monster, somehow it would still tear him apart. Then the abrupt joint jolt of the tree behind his back returned him to his senses. With a shout of rage, Hawk sliced forward with his blade and the ghastly head came off in a shower of blood. Hawk stepped away, took a moment to collect himself, and st his, still his shaking. And slowly he knelt. He wiped his snow, his sword on the snowy ground, leaving bright streaks of blood as he cleaned it. He picked up a fresh handful of snow and crushed it into his eyes to combat his lightheadedness. Then he stood, trying to put not much weight on his injured leg. Sheathing his sword carefully, Hawk returned to the gruesome corpse. With a quail of dread, he grabbed the shaggy fur between the wolf's ears and lifted his prize. Holding it as far from his body as possible, he began the slow, painful journey back to town. That was chapter eight.